Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Wow, this is amazing. Um, so, what? Uh, my name is Nelson Schumann. I'm the president of Restore to Freedom, and my good friend Christopher Milo over here that has the uh, mohawk. If, uh, I think he's the only mohawk in the room. So yes. So I remember I came to visit him for the first time in uh, July of 2018, and. Uh, we got along like we were brothers, like from the very second that we met each other. It was amazing. And God was just all over uh, the, the, the meeting. Well, then I came back and saw him again in March of uh, this year. And he called me after I was getting ready to leave. And he said, hey, Nelson, why don't we do a conference of our own with our own people where we can speak about what the Holy Spirit wants us to say yes. and not to be afraid of what people in the church might say to try and shut us down because he said Nelson there's so many amazing results with people in their lives and their marriages that are going around the world right now and why don't we just do this on our own and I'm like huh and the Lord spoke to me and said do it because I will be there and I will bless it and people will come from all over the United States so I know that there's people here from Texas and Connecticut and Maryland Florida and New Jersey and, uh, and a lot of Buffalo and uh, Kentucky. Where else are you guys from? Indiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio. I'm sure there's some Ohioans here. Any, any other states I haven't mentioned yet? So it's amazing. Um, to do this really for the first time. So I've been traveling around the country for the last three and a half years doing this, and oftentimes in people's homes, sometimes in churches, if they'll let me. And and the results are amazing. You know, people are just saying, I, in fact, I had a woman just came up to me and said, I got delivered from alcohol from reading your book instantly. Instantly. And uh, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And I had another woman that had, had so much strife with her husband for years and years and years and years. Went through a divorce, got remarried, was going to go through another divorce. She came to one of these conferences completely delivered instantly after years and years and years of striving. And so that's the goal of this ministry is, and the goal of this conference, True Freedom, is to bring together people who are not afraid to speak the truth and what the Holy Spirit has been developing in their own ministries and bring us all together so that you can come to one conference and truly be free. Yeah. Because what good is it if we go to church our whole lifetimes yeah. yes. and we have so much fear and anxiety and worry and anger and stress and striving and who wants to be a part of that kind of a family? Right. Who wants to be married and miserable? You know, who wants to go through a divorce and get remarried and go through another divorce? Nobody wants this. And it's the enemy that's behind all this. And we're going to speak truth today. And it's going to get people set free yeah. today. Yeah. So get ready, because today, expect true freedom. Yes. Because it's been building all week. Anyone have any spiritual warfare come against you this week? Like everybody, including myself. Spiritual warfare like I've never seen before yes. in my life. And so it's all worth it, though, when we fight through it for the breakthroughs. If we give up, then the enemy wins. And we're not going to give up. We're going to pursue Jesus Christ. So expect today, expect tonight, miracles to happen. Because it's time. Christ is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And that's what we need to be. We need to pursue consecrating ourselves to Christ. Not what we can get away with on the grace that God's going to allow us to continue to live another day. Let's not take that for granted. Grace is amazing. But I would much rather pursue um, righteousness, purity, and then live that life now before it's too late, before I die, before I have Christ come back and then I miss the boat because I thought everyone that was preaching to me said that, well, grace is going to cover it all. Yet all of my behavior was control, manipulation, envy, jealousy, strife, dissension, everything of the enemy. In Galatians 5, 16 to 26, it says those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But well, we want to inherit the kingdom of God. We want to bring heaven to earth. We want to actually walk that out on a daily basis and behind closed doors. So get ready because we have Amanda Baugh and her band here from Northern Indiana. They are amazing. 
first heard Amanda back in um, March, she actually came to Fit for Life gym in Angola, um, and it was amazing um, uh, when, when she was uh, singing. I mean, I just feel the presence of the Lord so strongly. So I'm going to go ahead, and, and we're going to have our first speaker today. It's going to be Christian psychologist Dominic Kurtz. Anyone here for Dominic? He's awesome. He's a Pennsylvania. Um, and then we're going to have a, a break for lunch. Um, and also let you know, we are going to take two offerings because the speakers came in faith. And we want to sow into this because it is a blessing to get freed. And so we're going to take a, uh, an offering before lunch and then again uh, this evening to let you guys know. Then we're going to have Christopher Milo speak at 1.30. And maybe he might play some piano for us. Yes. He might make us laugh. And uh, then we have my good friend Robia Scott. Remember the movie on the plane? She's a really good villain, but in real life, she's very nice. <laughs> I've known her for 10 years, her and her husband, James, and their daughter, Gemma. And then uh, I will close things out at the end and expect lives to be changed. Yes. Expect you to come. You know, a lot of you that have come in here who are beaten down, who don't have much smiles on your face. Um, and, and I get that. I understand that. When the enemy's been hitting you all this time, forever. I'm expecting a whole bunch of smiles by the time we're done with this, and a whole lot of tears cried because there's going to be a lot of truth here and a lot of freedoms to be released. So, so I'm going to turn things over to my good friend Amanda. There she is. I love that Nelson talked about the opposition coming into this conference. We've had opposition. I'm, I saw everybody's hand that was raised, and. Um, I hear it all the time, I think you've heard it all the time too. You've heard things like praise pushes back the enemy. Amen. That's not just something that we say. There's truth. And I want to read you this truth. Psalms 44, verse 5, it says, Only by your power can we push back our enemies. Only in your name can we trample our foes. When we come here, we're going to come into a time of worship. One of the things that the Lord has taught me throughout the years is that worship is warfare. So whatever's been distracting you, whatever opposition you've had, and it feels like a giant, you're just staring at that big giant. I love the song that we're going to intro into. It's called Raise a Hallelujah. It was actually written because there was a little boy that they were praying for. He was near death. I know there's some people in here right now that have family members that are in the hospital. I'm telling you, worship with everything that you have right now. It's your opportunity. Would you stand with us? We're going to raise a hallelujah and push back the enemy in Jesus' name.
So it's just amazing. He's been on uh, numerous national TV appearances, including interviews for a number of documentaries on rage, violence, troubled youth. And he's the creator and steward of Restoring Relationships, which is a ministry dedicated to helping people create a victorious life by walking them through the process of addressing their most difficult challenges. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Dominic. Susanna Robertson in the back. Just so you know, now you know her name. It sounds like Susanna with an S, but it's all Z's. Okay? So we're glad to have her with us. And I'd like to have a word of prayer. Father, we've already invoked your presence. We ask now in the name of Jesus Christ that all that pours through me is truth and nothing but the truth. My opinions have no value. And nobody's opinions have eternal value. So we're asking that you would reveal to each one of us what we need to see that we have not yet seen. That you would reveal to us what we need to surrender that we have yet to surrender. And that you would reveal to us what we need to repent of that we have not yet repented of. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, I come from Pennsylvania. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pennsylvania Central. It's a very rural area, and it's cold there, too. And it's where I was born and raised, and my whole life is about four square miles. Yeah, where I was born, every house I ever lived in, except when I went away to college. And who would have thought? But uh, it's a beautiful town. If you ever come passing through, give me a call. We'd love to have you. So, as I begin here, um, I want to say that we're going to talk about the soul first. Here's why. I am a psychologist, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. And those of you that are psychologists, I mean that in the right spirit, and I'll tell you why. Sigmund Freud and his contemporaries, who established psychology about 150 years ago, was one of the darkest figures in world history. Just remember that. If anything can come out of darkness, you got to be suspicious of it. But there's some truth in psychology. We know that. And there's also a lot of error. Now, in the garden, the enemy used truth mixed with error. It's, that's why he's called a beguiler. Beware the beguiling spirit. We say, no, no, there's truth here and there's deception here. Uh -uh. A beguiler takes a piece of truth to engage you and then uses the lie to ensnare you. Be very, very careful. Human psychology on the secular front has not added anything to the truth of Scripture. Let me give you the root. The root is suche, P-S-U-C-H-E. It's the Greek word for soul. So they had the right idea. we got to look at the soul. And the ology part is the study of. When people come to me, they don't want their soul studied. They want it restored. Psalm 23.3, the same Christ who regenerates our spirit in the day of spiritual salvation is the same Christ who will restore your soul. 23.3 of Psalms. So only Christ can do that. If it required the price of the only begotten Son of God, 
to die, shed his blood for you and I to be redeemed to Father God through the act of Calvary, of the shed blood and the resurrection that conquered sin, Satan, and death. You think about that price? Do you really believe it makes logical sense that we could go or should go somewhere else for the restoration of our soul? That defies all logic. Now, am I trying to say you don't go to a psychologist? No, come see me. Well, what's the role? <laughs> what's the role of the psychologist? He or she is to awaken you to truth and walk you in, because anything else they give you is second or actually not even going to help you. And I used to be a blind guide. There are many blind guides out there. I was a believer. Well, you're a believer. How are you blind? The enemy has blinding power in any area of my life that I have not surrendered to God. He has the capability of blindness. And that's in 1 John 2, 9 to 11, written to the believer. So a blind guy, you see, is someone who has held something back where the enemy gets hold of. It could be sin. It could also be pain. And the pain part comes from those in fallen humanity, usually the people we love the most. Have you ever noticed the people we love the most are the ones who have the capability of hurting us the worst? Well, of course. Why? We expect more from them. And we're fallen people in a fallen world. Wherever two or three are gathered, we offend one another. So the issue is, are we going to go through the place of victory, restoration, and healing? Or are we going to go down the road of hurt, hate, harm? I'll show you that in a visual. Visuals that Joseph will be putting up are available in full color in the manual. So it's available to you if you don't want to take notes and draw things. And we also have the journal for walking through. That just gives you an idea of what's available. And also our online series. Why? That video series is very, very laser focused to walk you and I through the place of our greatest need. What would that be? Our place of worst pain. After the sin condition, we've been cleansed. We need to keep going to the Lord. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. So don't stop going daily for the cleansing. But oftentimes believers don't know how to walk their pain to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because after all, when we've experienced the pain, what happens is we feel like God has left us. Where is he? He didn't preempt it. He didn't rescue us. He's obviously not here in it. Those are all lies of the enemy. He is there. Well, then why doesn't he rescue me? Because he gave free will, even to the offender. Well, he, he's God. And he shouldn't do that. He shouldn't do it that way. He also wants to prepare you and I to trust him in that pain in ways that we can lead others through it. My qualifications as I stand before you are not on the basis of my psychology degrees. My qualifications are based on the fact that I ruined virtually every precious relationship I ever had. I was the best at ruination. God restored them, all of them. There would be no reason that you would be here to sit and listen to what I had to say if I were back in the day of ruination. I would have nothing to offer you. And it's at that point that he showed me it's very, it's almost impossible for me to lead another person to a place where I had never gone. So I've gone in that. I've had the depression. I've had the fear, the anxiety. I was held captive to the point I had panic attacks. Where does a psychologist go when he has panic attacks? <laughs> think about it. It's going to ruin his image, don't you think? All of that God was using to show me there were areas in my life that I had not previously seen. Did you notice in my prayer, I said, God, show us what we do not see. The enemy has blinding power. It's what Jesus said in the synagogue when he read out of Isaiah 61, I have come to give sight to the blind. I thought that was like people like Bartimaeus. No, it includes I blind people. It's blind of mind. You cannot attack or surrender an enemy to God or fight an enemy that you cannot see. And then he said, I've come to set the captives free. We have prison ministry. I know what that is. No, it includes inmates and prisoners. It's actually captivity of heart. I had all of that. And then I've come to set at liberty the oppressed. What's that? Well, that's the book of psychology that I have to use to diagnose people. It's called the DSM. 
You ever hear of it? Yeah. Yes, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual number five. Well, that must mean it was a number four. And a three. And a three R revised. And a two. And a one. And a several revised in there. Which suggests to you, I guess we don't have all truth in the realm of psychology. And you know what's interesting? Certain disorders that were in one, two, and three disappeared in four and five. What happened there? Gotta be real careful with this. Psychology has often flown by the seat of its pants. And we've entrusted our eternal soul to it. Be careful. Again, my role, a therapist's role, a counselor's role, a psychologist's role, a psychiatrist's role is to awaken you and I to truth and walk you in it. We yes. do not heal. We cannot heal. A fallen human being cannot heal or restore the soul of another human being. Know the limits. Why? So that instead of looking out, we look up. Did not Christ say in Matthew 27, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth? Why would we go anywhere else? Go to someone that will walk you with him in that power, that someone will navigate you externally, as I do, Joseph does, others in our ministry, and the Holy Spirit will walk you internally. So I trust now that I've established the role of psychology with regard to you and I, the believers of truth, of the Word of God, and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go with the soul, Joseph. Oh, by the way, if you thought it looks like that, it doesn't. Okay? We're trying to put a material, a graphic to an immaterial existence of the human soul. The first is the intellect, the place of our thoughts, our ideas, our dreams in life, our knowledge, our memories. Some of the friends I have here that have come to visit, and always my son and our staff, I'd love to talk about our ideas and our dreams for the ministry and life. Because we share on that basis. And God awakens in that dialogue, in the intellect. It's also called the cognitive area of our mind. You've heard cognitions, and cognitions are thoughts. Next part, emotions, but they're feelings, passions, attitudes. And they're inextricably tied with what I'm thinking in my intellect. Then I think, here I point to my head, that I feel, and I point here at the solar plexus area, in the, in the depths of the heart of my uh, soul, and what I do is then I act. The will, action, behavior, motivations, based on what I'm thinking and feeling. Now, a lot of psychology theories like to reduce it to cognitive behavior. Now, you're already enlightened on the limitation of that. Cognitive behavior is intellect, cognitions. If you change a person's thoughts, you change their behavior. That makes sense. Yes, for any behavior that is not in a position to be ignited by emotions. What does that mean? If I've been kicked, beaten, ridiculed, scorned, abused, rejected, abandoned, betrayed by the most important man in my life who, be, who was my protector and he became my predator, if that doesn't unravel me, I'm not normal. That will unravel me. Now, I can't help that the memory of my mind is echoed. And you know who creates that echo, particularly in the painful area. While the mind, its theater is circulating, it stirs feelings related to what the event is about. So if I'm being degraded, if I'm being devalued, if I'm being bullied, I'm going to feel in my emotions hurt, bitterness, resentment, even hatred, even for one who I love the most. Yes, that's, no, that's opposites. You can't love and hate. They're not opposites. Love for the, the object of my passion is uh, the hate that comes from that love is because that love has been betrayed. So the hate response is really the, the experience of being betrayed by the one I love. But the hate that now rises up in my soul is more than beyond wound is infected. Because we all say, we all know, that you cannot be in a fallen world without being wounded. Don't ever believe that you can escape wounding. 
Jesus said it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Okay, and that's Luke 17, 1, I believe. It is impossible. He said to his disciples, stop believing in this fallen world that you're going to escape offenses, even at the hands of those that you love the most. So, offenses will come. Jesus himself was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He didn't escape wounding, but he never got infected. And a lot of the psychological world uses that term, wounding. But they don't use infection. And it's not the wound that debilitates. It hurts. Over and over especially. Repeatedly it hurts. But when the wound transitions to infection, you no longer own it, manage it, control it. It controls you, it owns you, it poisons you, and it makes you toxic. And when your soul is toxic, you're going to gravitate to toxic relationships without even trying. Because the spiritual activity that's coming around the toxicity, they're circling out there in the invisible world making connections with that person that you have an object of uh, romance for or friendship or whatever it might be. And what will happen is they will remain dormant until there's a connection made and you hope you get to the place of what's called a knitted soul as we talk about as uh, the word talks about between Jonathan and David. Jonathan's soul was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved David as his own soul. So we now know that the soul is the connection of all humanity on the horizontal plane, but the spirit you see is all exclusive connection with the spirit of God, Romans 8, 5, 8 16. His spirit, the Lord, bears witness with my spirit that I'm his child if I'm born again. Only if I'm born again. If I'm not, my spirit is dead in trespasses and sin. Now I'm re relegated to a soul life based upon all the wounds and infection in it. So you can see why people without Christ have such disturbances. But people with Christ have such great disturbances too. We were talking about the enemy is attacking all of us. And what he does is, is he operates and gets access to the influence places of our soul. He gets massaging our mind with thoughts and ideas that, that resist and come against God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. This is, as you know, the stronghold verses written to the believers at Corinth. This is not for the heathen. They wouldn't have understood it. They wouldn't have read it. For the weapons of our warfare, Paul said to the Corinth church. He's saying, to our warfare, you believers, I'm a believer. He's saying to Corinth, are mighty through God, are not carnal, that's of the flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. The enemy puts imaginations in there. He puts a theater in there. And all of a sudden, you and I are believing something that is not true, but it's more true than reality itself. The truth becomes a lie. The lie becomes the truth. Because his access is way too powerful. Not an issue of possession. It's an issue of the access that I gave him by not surrendering places in my soul that I didn't even know were there from my early years of childhood. And you might say, well, what's the point of looking back to childhood? We can't change the past. It's not about that. God will not give you your past back. It's not about the events, although we need to identify them. It's about the impact from the events. Amen. The impact is still in me. Yeah. I go into my next season of life, which is adulthood. First season is birth to about 18. The wounds come from caregivers that make decisions oftentimes that we have no say in. They're not bad. My parents weren't wrong for doing that. They weren't sitting when they said we have to move and we can't stay here. They had to go, but it hurt. Well, I'm not allowed to feel pain because they didn't mean it. No. No. What if I'm peeling an orange and I slip on the knife? I can't go to the hospital. It's an accident. You're hurt. It's a wound. And what the enemy does is he gets in there and begins to whisper resentment yeah. for what happened that was nobody's fault. Be careful the wounds that the enemy will not let you identify that had no intention on the part of your parents or caregivers. So you see, this is not about dishonoring. 
This is not about vilifying or blaming. This is a recognition between me and God that sometimes, because my parents were fallen, they did things that they were part of their fallen nature, and it hurt me and my brothers and sisters. But we were not allowed in our own minds and hearts to ever declare that wound. And if you can't declare it before God, the great physician, then there will be no healing. All right. So Joseph's now showing what an infected soul looks like. Okay. Um, we have slides in our later on. He doesn't have to go to that. That actually shows the, the healthy soul can have what's called legitimate anger. And we put in there a night. Oh, there it is. He does that. Okay. Now, see. That's be angry and sin not. Ephesians 4 26. You can be angry. It's a it's a cat. A feline, a uh, house cat. It's not going to take over the house. It might be a nuisance. It might claw at you, scratch you a bit, but, but you don't have to sleep with one eye open. It's maybe ten pounds. But you see the seven hundred pounds up here in tiger, the anger is no longer anger, it's transition to rage. And at Ephesians 4.26, you can find both, both definitions in the same verse. Be angry, sin not. So we now know that, that biblical anger is without sin. Well, what about the person who loses control of their anger? Like I always did. You just define the next one. That's rage. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The old world word wrath is rage. Okay, the kitten is a wound. That won't debilitate you. It'll hurt. The tiger is rage. Rage. And by the way, all these visuals are in the manual. Now, when the rage is in there, you don't control it ever. It controls you. And you know what the next verse is? 427, written to the believing church at Ephesus. Neither give place to the devil. The rage gives invite to enemy spirits. And that's what it does. By the way, the, the word in the Greek for anger is orge, O-R-G-E. It's a deeply passionate expression. But it does not go to the place of sinning in retaliation, even in mind. The word for uh, rage or wrath is thumos. It doesn't use this definition in the Greek, but you will conclude this definition after you read it, and it means firestorm. How I many people does it take to put out a firestorm and it's in one person? We are not ever intended to have a raging fire of bitterness and hate in our soul. And that will bring us down. And that will come from unclaimed pain. So let me say the four things that we, we do when we are hurt and violated, even if we don't realize it's happening to us. First, we run from it. We don't literally run. Although, sometimes we do. Jonah did. Jonah ran from Nineveh. He was supposed to cry against Nineveh. Let's say it was that way. And he ran that way to Tarshish. Actually had to go to the port of Joppa to get on a ship, cross the sea to Tarshish. Jonah hated Nineveh. Now you're finding out that Jonah was not just called for Nineveh. Jonah was called for Jonah. Because God knew he had bitterness in his heart. He hated because the Ninevites terrorized the Israelites and killed them. The purpose of this is to show you how you and I go into disorder. As soon as he rose up and left presence of the Lord. I want you to notice how many times that phrase is mentioned. The whole theme of Jonah is not just about being swallowed by the fish and repentance. That's big. He left the presence of the Lord. Now you don't have to run geographically away from your home. You can stay in your home for a hundred years and run from the Lord. Yeah. He left the presence of the Lord. So running from the wound is first. But I'll just add this real quick. Because he was in a state of fear in his soul, it immediately triggered neurotransmitter deregulation. You know what that means? His noradrenaline, his adrenaline, his dopamine, his cortisol, his serotonin was in what's called major deregulation. You ever hear of any of those neurotransmitters? Yeah, 
They're named in the meds. They're named in the meds. Because the meds are designed to artificially re-regulate the neurotransmitters. Thank God every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. But it's a good gift. It will not restore your soul. It may stabilize you, and it's okay. It's okay. God allowed man to figure out the, the meds. But don't, don't believe that you'll ever be set free in the soul because of meds. You already know that. And there's not a doctor that will tell you that. If she will say, you will be able to maybe tolerate, but then sometimes they have to adjust them. Okay, so now you know, at that point, Jonah, I don't know if he had an apothecary back then or not, but here's what happened. Because of the fear in his soul, he it released noradrenaline, the precursor to adrenaline, and injected adrenaline in him, and it went like this. It's instantaneous. It's like when a big old bear jumps out. You don't have to say, ah, oh, release noradrenaline. Or adrenaline, release adrenaline, and boom, now you can fight or flight. No, it's an instantaneous secretion that puts you in a position of fight or flight to survive a catastrophic situation. Jonah, nobody was running right, to Jonah. Jonah was so filled with bitterness and hate to the call to Nineveh that noradrenaline was released, the adrenaline, I'm not doing it. He left the presence of the Lord, and he's in a high manic episode. You look and the description of him running, he couldn't get away from his home. He left his home. You ever seen uh, a person like they had a manic episode and they just took off, okay? <laughs> or they clean their house into all night long and they just had all this energy as a manic episode. Okay, as soon as he gets to Joppa, he goes down into the ship, he rapidly cycles into a major depressive disorder. Why? He's sleeping when there's a storm going on. See, you know a person is in a pathological condition of disorders in psychology. You know when they're responding totally counter to what the event is bringing. That makes sense? He's ready. The ship's about ready to go down. He's sleeping. You know the rest of the story, but here's what I wanted to tell you. When a man or a woman or a boy or a girl goes into a high manic episode and then rapidly cycles to a major depressive disorder, they used to call it manic depressive, they call it bipolar now. Why? Two extremes. High, low. Here's the even line. That's your first bipolar prophet, Jonah. Now, why did I say that? What Freud and his contemporaries did was make you amplified to look only at the symptom. The bipolarity. Let's treat this. Let's do therapy. Let's do ther circular reasoning. Let's talk about what happens during the manic episode. By the way, you'll find none of that dialogue between God and Jonah. Let's find out about when you rapidly cycle and shift into the major depressive disorder. Let's talk about that. Why? The issue is he left the presence of the Lord. God created us to be in major distress because he loved us when we leave his presence. Wow. It's a gift. Wow. Wow. It's not a pleasant gift because when we're in rebellion, and sometimes we know it like Jonah did, and sometimes we don't. If everything is la-di-da, we're never coming back. Such is the human nature that doesn't seek after God. So let's look at any disorder that you and I have. All oh, the spiritual whispering now. Well, wait a minute. Biochemical. It's genetic. It's, oh, please. Listen, listen, folks, if I'm wrong, because it's not based on my opinion, if I'm wrong, you lose nothing. If you're wrong, you stay in bondage. Bring Christ to the scene regardless of what the disorder is. Get the meds, bring Christ to the scene. Avoid the meds if you want, bring Christ to the scene. All power is given to him in heaven and in earth. Oh, I believe that. Do you trust it? Believing it is saying, I believe he can do that. Trusting it says, uh, it doesn't work for me. I'm not sure I believe that. I've heard these people say, and this situation, these people say this over here, and these people are people. Go to truth. Go to truth. We're going to go to the relationship sequence. This is 
the whole diagram of the walk through Calvary. I did start way back with the four things people do when they're wounded. I'll finish that. We run from it. We don't have to leave our home. We run it hard. Second, we cover it. Pain concealed is pain unhealed. Every believer, if they don't recognize that they have pain in them, is covering that pain right now. It became part of their natural form of defense. We've all done it. I did all four of these, by the way. Pain concealed, pain on you. Third, we deny it. Oftentimes we deny it not because we know it's there. We oftentimes, and, and just deny it, we actually will deny it because we're blind. We deny it because we're blind. I'm not, I'm not hurt. Yeah, my father left when I was 13. Doesn't bother me. Now that person had to protect their soul and came up with some ideas that were uh, massaged in there by the enemy. It's impossible that that didn't matter. What they're saying is either, I don't want it to matter, it's too painful, or it's been so long ago, I pushed it down, I don't want to feel it, I've learned how not to feel it, so it really doesn't matter anymore. So they, what they have done is they have desensitized themselves to the pain. It's just like having Novocaine in the dentist chair. Do you have pain when you're sitting there when you have Novocaine? You'll say, no, I have Novocaine. No, you had pain. You didn't feel it, but you had pain. As evidence when it wears off and then all the trauma is revealed. So be careful because being desensitized to the pain will keep you from ever surrendering to God for godly sorrow and cleansing and healing. Man. Okay, and I, I'm going to take it further from the truth. Remember Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, yeah. verse 23. Peter was confronted by this sorcerer. He had all this power, and then he saw the power of the Holy Ghost, and he said, I want this power. He said, let me purchase this power of the Holy Ghost. Peter rebuked him right away. Thy money perish with thee, that thou believest that thou could purchase the Holy Ghost with money. I perceive that thou art in the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness. What? Gall? Go to Matthew 28, sponge, dipped in with spear, vinegar mingled with. Do you remember what the vinegar was mingled with? It was gall. Well, what's, what's your point? It's an anesthesia. You're in the bond of iniquity, meaning deep wickedness and bitterness. Bitterness is a gall of anesthesia to keep you from feeling the pain. Wow. And now you're going to fight off every human being that gets close and starts to get close to touch the infected wound because you're hypersensitive and you're guarding it and spirits are there helping. And that's why when you say something to somebody and they lose control, you hit a nerve and your stimulus might have been this big, but the response was this big. That's because the only thing that can come forth is rage. And spirits are now, because they've been given place to the devil, are now amplifying the rage. You see? Yeah. So you see, in this case, anesthesia, bitterness anesthesia, will keep you and I from healing. You say, well, what's the remedy? Godly sorrow, not worldly. What's worldly sorrow? It floats around in the gall of bitterness. Worldly sorrow leads to death. The death of what? The soul. The soul dies of worldly sorrow. What's the first feeling you have? Depression. Depression, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a, you know, a condition of the DSM, the psychologist. No. Depression is the experience of soul death. Why? The person feels rejected. The person becomes depressed. The person feels as if they have no communion connection with anybody. They can be right there with loved ones, bouncing off an invisible force field, trying to get into their heart. And that force field is designed to keep them out, not to get hurt again. And the same force field that keeps them out, keeps him in or her in. And now they're in the infection of bitterness and depression. And the reason why many people take life out of the body is because when the soul feels death in it from depression, from worldly sorrow, like a stagnant pool that's contaminated with toxicity, oils, and bugs, when that person feels that, their 
walking dead people. They're convinced that there's no hope for life being renewed within them. It's all enemy lies in the darkness. Because when we conceal the pain, God will not heal the pain. And the spirits live in the concealed pain. Amen. So you're not alone. Yes. Been there deeply depressed. Couldn't get out. Couldn't be reasoned out. You can't reason anybody out of depression. You draw them out by the spirit of God. You pray godly sorrow over them unto repentance. You bring forth the power of God's touch in a way such as they have never known. You speak into the throne room as the highest intercessor on behalf of that one deeply afflicted. Don't let the devil tell you, having danced around that depressed person for years, tell you that it's hopeless. You're never going to draw him out. You're never going to draw her out. He's a liar. You speak against that every day. And this is why we're losing 22 precious warrior soldiers a day. Our heroes, 22 a day in, in suicide because they brought home the horror of the war with them. You can take that man or woman out of war, but you can't take the war out of that man Amen. until you bring the Christ to that battle. Amen. We're trying to teach the loved ones who are there caring for the one with PTSD. You're the medic now. You're the soul medic. S-O-U-L, the soul. You speak into them. You promise over them. You call those spirits out, even when they can't speak, even when they can't talk, even when they won't talk. You speak over and through them. In the name of Jesus, morning, noon, night, and breakthroughs will happen. You're the intercession. The greatest voice in the throne room of heaven is the one closest to that one, the one being hurt the worst. Many of these mothers, women, girlfriends said, he's just a shell of a man. He's not who he was when he left. His soul is so broken. All they did for us, we got to awaken a movement that we become those medics on the home front. Even if you don't know how a loved one that is in that situation, they're all our loved ones. They were willing to give the greatest price. I didn't intend to go there. Maybe God did. Come on, man. Yeah. Amen. Relationship, mutuality is the connection. It's the soul intimacy of the communion between Jonathan and David, the knittedness. Whether, whatever word you want to use, and there are not many words to describe the true communion. And if a husband and wife don't have this, there will be something missing in the fullness of the relationship that will not mean they don't love each other. It will mean the expression of that love will be hindered by the fact that they haven't knitted. And the thing that hinders knittedness is brokenness and infection in the soul. And don't forget the fourth proclamation of Christ after I've come to preach the gospel to the poor was, I have come to heal the broken heart. Who among us here has not ever had a broken heart? You believe some fallen humanity. It's great when God leads us to someone we can weep with, that will hear us, that will be with us when we're hurting. He, he, he calls the church to that. No one can heal the broken heart but the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring him in to heal your broken heart. He will actually lead you and guide you and show you things about that brokenness that you never saw. And he will show you, as Job said, things too wonderful that you knew not. Things too wonderful that you knew not. That's what Job said in chapter 42. Don't hang everything on the horror of what Job went through. As Paul Harvey says, tell the rest of the story. I saw things too wonderful that I knew not. The trust comes with mutual communion, but the relationship will go down the road of testing. A relationship that cannot be tested is a relationship that cannot be trusted. This is a fallen world. Do not run at the offense. Lean in. I used to think I was a fighter because I was a bar bouncer in my bad days. <laughs> That's my dude right there. <laughs>
waiting to hear the rest of the story. I got them all out. My friend said to me, Dominic, you fought a good fight. You just led with your face. You see my nose? It will always be the representation of those bar fights. The offenses are not just intentional. We know what they are. Abusive, berating, all kinds of abuse. Make sure you focus on those wounds by default. When my parents got divorced, they didn't wake up one day and say, let's hurt our five children. Let's really hurt them in divorce. Yeah. Of course not. But it hurt us. And nobody knows what to do with that when it's happening because everybody's in pain and the people you would normally go to are the ones creating the pain. So you see, this is how this pain begins to trickle within your soul and it begins to layer up and it begins to get into infection. The wound becomes infected. So here's where it goes into infection. The next stage is hurt. I want you to see now, by the way, the blue is the healthy script. Blue is the water of healing. Water washes, cleanses, purifies. The red is the fire. It's the fire of burning infection. It's the carotid arteries. It expands. My kids used to say when they saw the eruption of the rage in me, Dad, chill. Dad, chill. Oh, they were saying, cool down, because I was all red in the face. See that noradrenaline coming, feeling like I had to defend myself. Did you ever come face to face with a man or a woman that while they were defending themselves, they were offending you? Guilty. <laughs> Until God set me free of that. Now, do I still step over? Uh-huh. Never like it was before. But still, I have stepped over. Very aware of it, and I immediately or soon after go and say, forgive me. I'm wrong. No excuses. And no explanations that sound like excuses. The hurt will create detachment where we pull away, we shut down. Many of us have detached fathers. These are fathers who have the capability of love, who have love in them, but you never saw a twinkling of it. So I say to people in my office that are adults, sons and daughters, did your dad love you? Oh, I know he loved me. They always say, no. Good, praise God. Do you feel like he loved you? Almost always. Silence. If you don't feel like that one loves you, you begin to lose belief that he does. It's not that he doesn't. It's that the ability to express it is hindered by his own soul infection. Well, what would his be? Did you know that we are condemned to repeat what we do not heal? One of my dad's greatest methods of wounding was to be raped, right, put down, take value, and dignity. Now, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, I could sit back after I was completely ripped by his words. He just took my dignity. Well, of course not. You never use those words. I don't, but the heart is the hard drive. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. The heart is imprinting all of that. Now, I go to school. And because the most important man in my life, who represents the greatest authority, has persistently taken my dignity, and it looks like I'm blaming him, I'm really not. I'm so angry at him, I gotta find someone else down the food chain. This is what creates bullying, right here. The most bullied person is oftentimes the one who's bullying. We just don't see it. Amen. We see the bullying, we don't see the bullier of the bully. Yeah. That doesn't excuse the bully. It explains it. It does not excuse him yeah. or her. So in effect, I'm looking to get my value back. You know what the enemy says? Here's a good chance to take somebody's value. This is how you get your value back. Take their value. I didn't hear that script, but I saw an opportunity to make someone else feel like me. And when I get down to that vengeance mode, you know how I define it? If you don't feel my pain, I'll make you feel my pain. Mm. That's what I was doing. Mm. That's what bully does. You don't feel my pain, I'll make you. Well, I have nothing to do with your pain. They're not talking in script, you know. <laughs> what did I do to you? 
You don't understand. I got all this pain in me. It's got to go somewhere. You're the one right here. I always say the one closest to the volcano better take cover because the lava splash is going to come on them. All right? So the de hurt and the detachment will cause a person to pull away. Once they do that, they can't knit. So that hurt has to be cleansed. Godly sorrow. And I know that's a mystery right now for some of you. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Godly sorrow is a cleansing so purifying, so powerful, that if you experience you will never ask the question as to whether or not you ever experienced it. Because I get the question, how do I know I've experienced godly sorrow? I'll say you'll never ask the question. <laughs> what do you mean? It will be so profoundly cleansing. God put me to sleep to do it. Now, it's not like he literally put me to sleep. I just remember laying back one afternoon and I went into a place that was somewhere between here and there and I didn't fully know what was happening. He's not going to telegraph it. Oh, by the way, Dominic, I'm going to have you take a nap this afternoon and I'm going to pour some godly sorrow. No, no, he just, boom, came down upon me. But you have to understand, I was begging for it. God, I need this sorrow. I need this to tenderize my heart. I've had bitterness and rage all my life. Now I've repented. I want the sorrow and more repentance. And he filled me with sorrows like sea billows roll your moat. You know that beautiful hymn? Oh, it is well, it is well with my soul. And if you read the story of Horatio Spafford, it was birthed out of great, unspeakable sorrow. How many know the story of Horatio Spafford? How many? You need to look at it. He lost his four daughters in a shipwreck while they were going to meet D.L. Moody in his, in his uh, New England, in his uh, uh, British campaign in the late 1800s. He stayed back after the Chicago fire, where, by the way, he lost all of his holdings. And he had to finish a business. And he had previously, months before, lost his only son. The ship went down in 12 minutes. Read the story. You'll weep. Captain came to him as he was going. Oh, by the way, it was weeks before he heard anything because it was only by telegraph. He had no idea who had survived or who didn't. He just knew it was very tragic. And he gets a two-word note. I mean, no, from his wife. Saved alone. <clears throat> I think text was scripted, cryptic. Yeah, telegraph was very cryptic. Yeah. Not a whole lot of room there to say, I'm so sorry. Saved alone. On the way to meet his wife, the captain said, as best as I can understand, this is the grave. The grave of your daughter. I think I would have. Mm -hmm. Why? I serve you. Why? Why? How dare you? All I've done. Goes in the bowels of the ship, and he pens when sorrows like sea billows roll. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt. I, I was drowning in sorrow. Drowning. And I was afraid to take a breath because it was so real. And I did. It was glorious. I don't know how long I was in that state. I don't know. It could have been years and then God just made it minutes. It could have been minutes. It felt like a long time. When I awakened, I immediately tried to go back to sleep. And I said, God, put me back, put me back, God. Could, I, got, I got upset because the experience was so profoundly glorious, sorry to use it again, that to this day I'll never be able to describe what it was like. But what happened after it was a difference beyond the scope of anything I ever imagined. You say, well, maybe I'll have that experience. You don't have to. You'll have your own. It may look like that. It may not. Just ask for it. Just Beg for it. Plead for it. Give me your godly sorrow unto repentance.
kills the pride, kills it, kills the arrogance, kills it. There's nothing left in that. And to this day, because of how many of the hymns were birthed, I love the contemporary praise music. Man, there are bands so annoying. It. Don't stop. But when you get a chance as moved by the Lord, don't forget to bring in one of those hymns that were penned out of such great sorrow. Amen. Ecclesiastes 7, 6, sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Who wants sorrow? But as much as laughter comes, and it's great, and it's a great medicine, but the best medicine in a fallen world is a godly sorrow unto purification and cleansing in the name of Jesus. Amen. To close out, okay, to close. To what? Okay. You sure? Not 12 yet? I will not compete with food. Hurt, detachment, the next part is hate. You want all psychology? Summarize for you. Right here, this. When I'm offended, first I hurt, then I hate, then I harm. Isn't that good? First I hurt. Then I hate, then I harm. Hurt, I begin to detach because it's too painful to be around that person. This is why some of your children are drawn away to their peers. Well, that's the socialization. Yes, it is. But when they don't want to come to the dinner table and they'd rather be out with their peers, they're sending you a message. They just don't know how to do it. It's too painful sometimes to be here because you're not hearing my heart. We know, they say, some of the dumbest things we'll ever hear because they're children. But we have to hear their heart, yes, yes. even if it doesn't make sense. Yes. And sometimes they're trying to tell us there's something they're struggling with, and they want to know that they can trust us to tell it. And if they don't get it, they will always find someone, so the peer group becomes their surrogate family. The surrogate family is the substitute for the family they really want to be a part of, but it's too painful to connect with them. So you don't beat them back with a stick, you draw them back. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except the spirit of my father draw him. Draw their heart. How do you do that? Slip them a little note. Say, Daddy has been very hard on you recently, and I haven't been there, and I am so sorry. Would you give me a chance to just sit down and just listen to you? You have no idea what that does. Joseph has some great stories about his daughters, my granddaughters, about how he's done that. And, oh, it just uh, makes me weep every time I hear it. So the hurt, the hate, the harm is the vengeance. I'm just going to show you the vengeance now. I'm in toxicity. I'm in harm mode. I'm infected. Pure and simple. You're evidenced by your fruit. Not just the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 23, 24, everybody seems to skip the, the uh, fruit of the flesh, 19 to 21. It's actually uh, three verses of flesh, only two of the Holy Spirit. If you think about that, it's funny how we always skip over that. Well, it's written to the believing church, so keep in mind a lot of that fruit of the flesh is exhibited in believers when they're in the infection mode or they're in the vengeance mode. Okay, this is the hurt. This is the fire that needs to be put out by the road to grieving of the godly sorrow. So now I'm just going to hit the points, Joseph. Admission? No, uh, just go back for a minute. Oh, you don't have the rest of the circle. Oh, okay. You just have to get. You just have to get this. <laughs> yeah, you have to get this to get the rest of the circle, right? Oh, <laughs> <Good> boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the uh, admission and grieving, and that's the grieving of the godly sorrow. And then we get to the confront, which is rebuke and correction. And we are disclosing to God the truth of how you've been hurt. And then the victory road is the up road to nine o'clock where restoration comes through forgiveness and reconciliation, where you surrender, this is the place you give up to win. Remember, whenever you and I surrender anything to God, we give up to win. Everything on the earthly plane, you don't give up to win. Never surrender, but you do here. And then uh, you have a, uh, the road to healing to rebuild the relationship, or, or build it for the first time. There's a lot of talk about rebuilding, when in fact it was never built properly the first time. Okay, go ahead, Joseph. 
Now, we're, okay, this is the bitterness tree. I don't have time to go through this whole thing, but I, I want you, I'm coming from Hebrews 12, 15. Look diligently, look carefully, lest any root of bitterness, sorry about that, uh, lest any root of bitterness spring forth of any be defiled. You know about this, we've been covering the bitterness. I want you to notice that the bitter root uh, is not seen. Why? And that's why it's called a root. Now, if you go out here and look at any tree or bush, and somebody said to you, oh, there's a tree that doesn't have a root, you would say, that's ridiculous. Well, you can't see it, can you? No, it's evidence by what's growing above ground. Right, that's the, key. that's the key. But the problem is this. The enemy will allow you to look at what's above ground. He will never show you what's below ground because he's feeding that root. He's in giving that life. And this tree is dead. It's all red. It's a dead place. So this is what we call, when you and I have bitterness, which I did for too many years, when you and I have bitterness for anybody, whether known or unknown, we keep death alive. You're keeping death alive. Bury it. This has to be killed. Now, typical counseling years ago was you came in and you read one of these. You can't see it. Suicidal thoughts, sexual misconduct uh, for kids, curfew violations, depression, lying and deceit, theft, defiance toward authority, conduct disorders. There are all kinds because we have the youth programs as well. So, but there are many fruit that are not on there. Typically what the counselor would do is shimmy up the tree while they were taking you through counseling and try to saw off the limb. And I want you to liken the limb to like a thorn tree, yeah. which seems to have no real value except to hurt you if you get close to it. So, of course you know that if you saw off a limb of a tree, it doesn't die, it comes back fuller. Now let's go underneath and let's kill the root, the whole tree dies. The only way to kill that root is have it revealed. And only God, in many cases, will reveal that root. And that's what he did with me in my testimony. Yeah. And in my testimony, see, not only was I, did I go through pain and difficulty with parents who although loved each other, were so toxic, they could not get along, and their fighting and conflict was incessant. And then they put me in the care of a neighbor next door when I was six, seven, eight, because their work schedules did not, they overlapped, which meant there was this period after school till my father got home from day shift. And this man sexually abused me. So they put me in the hands of the predator. They didn't do it on purpose. See, there's another wound, and it's called uh, failed protection, but they didn't do anything wrong. Well, then you can't make it an issue. No, it's not about making it an issue. It won't it. I do have to deal with the wounds. You see, the, recognizing that there's pain in the incompleteness of parental, uh, uh, you know, authority doesn't vilify the parent. When a parent can't handle that, that parent is infected. And see, I couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle the truth. So my kids wouldn't give me the truth. I, I remember a father that uh, when he had his uh, a daughter in and, and she had revealed something to several people and then we had to have him in so she could tell him to protect her. And uh, she told it and he said, why didn't you tell me? I said, sir, that right there. That's why. That's why. What? Look at you. It wasn't safe. Doesn't mean that she didn't want to tell him. I wasn't safe. I wasn't safe. And you say, you lied to me. You lied to me. It's wrong. They lie. They're going to lie. But are we safe? And if we're not safe, that's how they protect themselves. Be careful. Because they want you to walk with them in their pain. But if you're keeping pain on their pain, they're not going to come to you. They'll go to a peer who's experiencing the same pain they are, who will be sensitive to them. And that peer will know more about everything that child is going through than you and I will. And that's not healthy. You know it's not. And therein lies the power of the peer pressure. So please understand that this root, again, can only be ripped up by the Lord and cleansed away by the godly sorrow. I, I will not diminish how many times I say that. I am tired of people, I'm closing with this, being caught in circular reasoning in their counsel. 
where they constantly go with the counselor, they go in, they talk about the depressive experience, or the fact that their dad lost control on them again, or their spouse, their husband, their wife, and this would happen, and then this is what it did to me, and I feel better now, and I talked about it, and great, we go out and we have no more solutions than we did when we came in. We're around Calvary. Around Calvary is a good place to be. We go around Calvary, but the Lord is drawing us through Calvary. Yes. And that's the, that's the decision to step through and be identified with the sorrow of Christ. So the example of it looks like this. A person comes in to me and said, I'm struggling with depression. I said, okay. Uh, Tell me about all the symptoms. I have trouble sleeping. I have trouble. My eating habits are bad. I, I can't get up. I, I have trouble going to work. I get distracted. I get. I'm in slow motion to do things. I shut down. I'm entranced. I mean, this. These people really know. I said, okay. There is something within you that God will show you that led you to the paralysis of what you feel in this depression. Now. You can come in here and talk with me over and over, or you and I can walk this out, but I have to hold you accountable to purposeful intention of decision to do so. And if you will follow this, not because it's me, you're not following me, you're following points of truth, and you're obeying it because it's not hearing the word that will transform you, it's doing it. James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. In John 3, 21, they that do the truth shall come to the light. And you might say, I know John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and will set you free. No is the Greek word genosko, and the Greeks, when they knew truth, they didn't question, they didn't challenge it, they did it. They didn't reason it. As soon as you go into certain reasoning, the enemy owns the reason. Well, let me process that for a while. Let me see what other people say about that. If you know it to be true and you don't obey it, you're all you're already lost. Yes. Amen. What you're basically saying is, I don't accept that as truth. Yep. And your issue isn't with me, it's with him. Yes. And if Amen. I'm giving you opinions, no. leave my office and don't look back. <laughs> run, Forrest, run. Get out. <laughs> if people are giving you opinions and, and you're paying them for their opinions, their opinions don't have eternal value. Mine don't even have temporal value. It has to be true or nothing. Yeah. Only the truth, and then we have to walk in it. So, when I came to Christ, to Calvary, the Holy Spirit drew me. Jesus said, no man cometh up unto me except the Spirit of my Father draw him. I was drawn. I surrendered my life, asked for the cleansing blood. I wasn't anywhere near a church. I was headed to a graveyard or a prison by my own doing. I was 22 years of age, and I... I experienced a peace, no fireworks, no like cataclysmic event, just, well, what is this? I couldn't even think it, let alone speak it. And I walked away and I thought, he began to order my steps. I didn't know that then. I saw it. He began to order my steps. He orders the steps of the righteous. I came to Calvary. I had an appetite all of a sudden for the things of truth. I'm now going around Calvary. Good place to be, around Calvary. Why? Worship, praise. Um, uh, study of the word, yeah. ministry beginning to develop, good place, never a bad place to be around Calvary. But 12 years later, because I was manifesting in my soul, my spirit was regenerated. His spirit was bearing witness with my spirit that I was his child. But my soul was exploding on my wife and my two kids from all that infection in there. And then 12 years later, and I was headed to a blue uh, hospital, I was looking for that blue hospital sign, and I was having a panic attack. And, and, and oh, 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 I'm going to go get whatever they have, pills, anything. And then I had read that morning, you no longer have the spirit of bondage again to fear. You have the spirit of adoption whereby you cry out of Father. Wait, this is bondage. This is the spirit. This isn't just a feeling. This is a spirit. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, spirit of fear, and I cast you out. In the name of Jesus Christ, boom. Amen. Panic attack gone. Amen. 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 Say, people said to me, wait, people said to me, wow, you have great faith. I said, no, I didn't. How would I? Well, you really believed, no, I didn't. Wait, well, how did it work? You didn't believe. I said, I obeyed. I obeyed. Yes. Well, I don't get that. You didn't believe. I obeyed. I don't want to tell me, well, I don't believe. I said, do it anyway. You didn't hear me. I don't believe. I said, you didn't hear me. Do it anyway. Right. Obey. <laughs> to obey is better than sacrifice. Obedience leads to repentance. Yeah. And it leads to submission. God will honor the obedience. 
The two sons of the man of the vineyard. Remember? He said, go thou. One said, I'll do it. Didn't. The other one said, ain't doing it. But he did. He said to his disciples, and they all said to him, the one who said he wasn't going to do it, but did, was the obedient son. It wasn't servants, it was son. Obey anyway. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, for whatever truth anyone wants to grab here from what they heard that specifically applies to them, would you give them the courage to obey right there where they are with you in and up. Lord, right now, strike all gaze outward because the enemy controls the outward view. Have them look in and meet your Holy Spirit. You may show names. You may reveal events. And then as you reveal, not just now, but in the hours and the days ahead, have them look up in repentance and say, God, forgive me, even though I was the victim of the abuse. I've hated this person, and now I see it. The sin of hatred is what infected me, not what he did to me. That wounded me. I've hated him, and that hate is spilled out on my loved ones. Forgive me, God. Cleanse me, Jesus, and I forgive him. Now you can forgive. But you must ask forgiveness first when the sun goes down on your wrath because you're outside of the ability to forgive an offender because the hatred in you binds you and your heart is not free. Lord God, we look forward to great transformations in the hours ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, thank you. That's uh, amazing, and again, uh, Dominic, um, I met him a couple of years ago, and uh, the Lord connected us. As I didn't know all that he had had known and all the depth that he had. I knew about the deliverance part and taking people through, and I saw a lot of miracles, but the combination of this, so what the Lord was showing me actually when I was down here is this is building throughout today. So by the time tonight we go through and we start taking our authority, and we knew the prayers, you know, just like uh, Dominic said, he took authority. Um, for those of you that don't know um, part of my testimony, part of it is, is I had a son who had essentially had a boy do some things to him he shouldn't have when he was around age eight, and it made him a mess for 10 years. 10 years of hell I went through. And then my mentor, which was the same mentor as Rabia, um, taught me in 10 minutes and said, Nelson, you need to take authority, command the enemy to go. He's hearing the voices of enemy that, that's tormenting him. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I go, he loves to torment me every day of his life. He's like, no, he's being tormented. I'm like, well, does, doesn't he have to want to be set free? He's like, oh, he wants to be set free, but he can't explain it because he's getting hit by all these thoughts. And living, you know, literally, it's, uh, a lot of people get up to 60,000 thoughts a day. So you can imagine if you're getting 60,000 negative thoughts a day, you know, it's going to be hard to interpret and try to discern what thoughts are coming from the enemy. And so um, I, I asked if I could pray for him the very next day when I was taught this. And I just said, uh, okay, here we go. I command every enemy spirit be gone in Jesus' name. And I release peace over your mind. And then I look really closely to see if I can see, like, demons flying out. And I couldn't see them. So I'm like, well, I don't know if this worked or not. But then the next day, I go out to mow the grass. I'm halfway done. And he comes walking out of the house. And, of course, he has not mowed the grass for me at this point for, like, two years. Never willingly did it. Never willingly ever did it. And he said, hey, Dad, can I finish mowing the grass for you? And I about dropped over. Because I'm like, that is not my son for the last 10 years. What happened? You know, and then he said, oh, by the way, I'm going to also get a haircut and apply for a job at Burger King. And I'm like, what? And I go in the house, and I'm just crying on the floor. And I'm like, Lord, what happened to my son? He said, you got your son back. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Did it still be like that? He said, yes. You took an authority over the enemy. Because you never prayed like that before. You prayed like... A, a gazillion Christians that were not effective prayers. Please, God, if it's your will, please, 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 please. He said the enemy doesn't have to back off at that point. But when you take authority, the enemy has to reset, has to go. You know, if there's nothing legal that gives him a right to stay. And in that case, I have authority over my son who's 18 years of age. I took it, I commanded it to go, and bam, he changed instantly. 
no longer striving, no longer arguing, because no longer is getting all these thoughts pummeling him every day to be mean to me, to be mean to his mom, to be mean to his siblings. So, so get ready for tonight. It's going to be so exciting, so powerful, because you're going to take authority in Jesus' yes. name, and we're going to see things break off that you never ever, and you'll feel a lot of time, you'll feel lighter. You'll be able to see more clearly. Literally, people see clearly like colors and stuff. And you won't be getting all these thoughts from him anymore because it's yeah. real. It is so real. So, um, so again, as I explained, we're taking an offering now. So for those of you, the ushers, if you can come forward and the, the baskets are over there. Um, at each seat, we have um, a uh, envelope where you can give either cash or check or credit card. Um, if you need pens, we do have some pens that are up here. Again, the speakers um, have come from all over the country, and this is a free will offering. Um, so give what the Holy Spirit has put on you. I never put pressure, but in my own ministry, I never ask for money. Um, the Holy Spirit speaks to people, and a lot of times people have their lives changed so dramatically, they just want to sow into it because then they become part of that blessing, part of the ministry. Um, have one lady that has given just a large, large amount of money over the last year and a half. And guess what? It's because she had her life changed and she had her marriage saved. And then she's now had her sister get set free. And she's getting other relatives set free. And she's actually starting to actually do ministry now herself. And so the Lord is allowing this to be able to pass it on. So who likes to get together for holidays with your family and fight and have arguments? You know, this is all about getting set free for the family. You know, I know there's some families that are here with children and parents, and they want to say, I want to do this now because I'm tired of going through around and around in circles, striving, fighting, arguing, and all that. So, so again, just give what the Holy Spirit, you know, speaks to you. Um, I'll pray over it right now, and then we'll go ahead and break for lunch after that. So, all right. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for today. Thank you, God, for all those that are here, Lord that have come from miles and miles and hundreds of miles and thousands of miles away, Lord Jesus, with the hope of restoring their lives to no longer striving and fighting and arguing, Lord, in their marriages and with their children, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for those that are so in, Lord, just bless them, Heavenly Father. Bless them, Lord. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And if, if you, I guess, the uh, Holy Spirit just told me, if you were to write a check, it would be restored to freedom, um, which is my ministry. And again, we'll just take all the monies and we'll, we split it up with the, the speakers. So, um, restored with a D to freedom. Um, so, um, and then um, the restaurant choices, if you've not already seen, um, it's great. You can walk to them. I mean, this is like the most convenient Marriott. You know, I don't stay normally at Marriott's because you got to pay for parking, you got to pay for, you know, whatever internet, you got to pay for everything. And I normally stay at like Fairfield Inns, the cheapest you can get, you know, for, Fair, for uh, Marriott properties. So it's a pleasure to stay. They spent $38 million on this property to renovate this, which is incredible. So that's why it looks like it's brand new when it's, I don't know how old that it is. And what's really cool is we found out, Christopher, Milo, and I, when uh, we came over here like in June, we were doing a Facebook Live. I didn't know if we could actually do one or not. Um, and it was kind of sketchy, but they gave us a tour. And then they were like, you're going to be doing a Christian conference here? And it's going to be about setting people free? Oh my gosh, there were so many employees of the Marriott Hotel here locally. They were like, I'm into ministry. I'm a pastor. I'm a worship band. I mean, there are so many Marriott employees that are so excited about this conference. They're like, we're so happy to be the first one. You know, the next one we're doing is going to be down in Houston in January the 18th. So um, it's growing, and it's growing. I mean, we're getting people signing up all over the place. So they want to have, see uh, a difference in their life, a real difference, not just a feel-good, come to church, oh my gosh, the presence was great, wasn't it? And go home and start striving and arguing again with their spouse and their children. You know, that's misery. So, so, um, so I'm going to pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for all those that have come. Thank you, Father God. Bless them, Lord. For those that have sown in, Lord Jesus, sow back into them by the end of today, Lord God, that they will be completely changed, that they will smile, they will laugh, they will have fun when they leave this conference. They will love their spouse. They will love their children. They will love, and they will, they will ask for forgiveness if they need to of those that they have hurt, Lord, that we will humble ourselves today, God, that we will come out of here just a brand new person that is like Christ, Christ-like. 
not like the world. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All righty. Well, um, okay, you're breaking for lunch now. We're coming back at 1.30. We're going to start with the one and only Christopher Milo, the guy with the mic. He's, he's, he's an awful lot different than what um, Dominic is, so just to let you know. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.